Labs.net. Um, we're going to be talking about wealth creation through portfolio management, portfolio optimization. Um, let's get started here on my screen that you guys can confirm that you are seeing here on the screen. Okay, so like I said, we're going to talk about a variety of factors. Some of the more complex ones, Kelly Criterion, Conditional Value at Risk, Cap M, which is really used for beta to compare your uh, stock positions against your overall uh, general gauge in the market, which is usually the S&P 500. We're also going to try to talk about option chain analysis because uh, a great example there was late last week, there was a sudden set of calls going in for um, biotech and then all of a sudden next day the biotech went up. So if you see these sort of things and look for these sort of things, you can do quite well um, at uh, the beginning of a low point. And also we're going to talk about um, portfolio optimization, uh, long-term position holding versus short-term, which is really day trading. We're going to talk about some of the ratios, Sharp and Sortino ratios. Cool, cool. Okay, so let's talk about the very first one, um, Kelly Criterion. And as I go, what I'll do is I'll update the chat box with a variety of links. Um, okay, so the first one, I'm basing the, like I'm basing these off of my own videos, but it doesn't mean I'm an expert in them. So we're going to talk about the first one on Kelly Criterion. So let me just pull up my browser here so that you can see all the glory. Um, strange. Okay. So I'm going to pull up the very first video. Um, and what I've done over the years, I've got about 1,500 videos on my uh, YouTube channel. And heard of the London. let me just pull up the browser here. Okay. Let me know if you guys can see the, uh, the browser uh, screen. It's with the YouTube on it. Just give me a yes or a no on it. You guys can see it okay? Okay, awesome. Thanks. All right, so um, I noticed I can you guys see my screen at all? Am I on camera? No? Can you guys see me on? I don't think I'm on camera. Does, does it really matter? No. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Um, anyways, uh, okay, so like I said in this video, um, if you guys got questions as we go, as I said, this is a group effort. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get... Um, some top some some good discussion here on on these topics the first one that is usually the most popular is definitely Kelly criterion and a lot of people don't use this and it's pretty hard for uh, humans to do uh, meaning that basically Kelly criterion is used for uh, throttle throttling your position management so if you have a series of winning uh, positions or losing positions, what the system will do is if you're basing it off of some kind of order management system that will allocate capital to your trading each and every day, what it will do based upon your winning ratio, will allocate and throttle up a capital available to, to the system to make it available. And if the system goes through a series of um, uh, losses, what will happen is the system will tighten the available credit and that's to protect your account. Um, is it, does anybody use this sort of um, sort of uh, methodology in their trading? Because uh, I'm trying to get a gauge of who uses what. Uh, just give me a yes or a no. Okay, there I am. Hi, everybody. Can you guys see my pretty face? <laughs> Somewhat. All right. So um, as I said, this is a group effort. So okay. So uh, RF is using Kelly Criterion. Um, no, but want to learn more about it from Brian. Okay. Um, let me, uh, so you guys can see me on camera and you can also, uh, see me, uh, see my browser. Just give me a yes. You can see both me, my face here. Uh, no. Uh, okay. So you can see both. Awesome. Thanks. Mug is there too. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks Gordon. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So let, let's look at some of the definitions here of what Kelly criterion is. Um, as I said, I'm not here to teach it to you. Um, out of, out of your position management or orders, uh, what would you say the, 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 the amount of dependency you put on Kelly Criterion? Uh, if somebody wants to br type up a uh, uh, amount of uh, 
uh, their whole portfolio analysis, how much emphasis do you put on, on Kelly Criterion? Because it is one of those important ones. It's no different if uh, you have a boss uh, that is allocating capital to you for each and every day of your trading. Um, it's kind of like a self-throttling methodology of keeping your account um, alive and, and pre preserving the account itself. So here's, can you see this definition here? Um, it's, it's used by gamblers. Uh, the odds are in your favor and uh, a simplified version. Main goal is to explain the full, let me just pull up the uh, Investopedia definition. It's usually the better one. Um, okay, so the basics we, we talked about, win probability and the win loss ratio. There's a very basic uh, formula used, which is the W is um, the wins and R is the actual ratio. So anybody using this at all? I know that some of you, if you guys want, whoever wants to unmute themselves, please go ahead and um, explain how you use it and how helpful it is. If, if you find it's, it's oversimplified, um, because this is probably the most popular way of, of protecting your, your account uh, if you do have a series of trades um, that are, let's say, going against you, you have a bad streak. If not, I can move on to the next topic. But uh, whoever's wanting to learn, just type them up. I mean, Google is your friend, as they say. If not, I can move on. Okay, let's move on then. Okay, um, let me go back to my document here. Okay, so the... Kelly Criterion is a, a very popular one. The other one is conditional ver, uh, value at risk, which is kind of analyzing the overall portfolio on a statistical point of view. Um, a lot of the professional um, institutions use this, uh, obviously, for when, they, when you hear about um, vetting, model vetting. They use this as part of their criteria to um, simulate the model before against a, a, a simulated portfolio before it is actually deployed into the wild of uh, live trading for an operation. So this is another way to do it. Uh, again, I have another video on it. Um, I'll just put that in the, um, in the chat box. And what I'll do is I'll pull up a definition of it. Just give me a second here. Um, Actually, you know what, um, let me pull up that definition and the idea, as I said, is to talk about this stuff. So let me pull up this um, browser. So let me just do a, okay, so this, originally there's value at risk. And as I said, I'm not here to teach you stuff. I just want to show you what can be used from a statistical point of view. I know Shalom's out there. He may, I don't think he actually would use it, but he's more of the, the statistical kind of guy. Um, but the value at risk is used to assess um, the, the condition of portfolio management. And let's pull up the good old Investopedia. Um, Anybody want to add any comments to this? This is now value at risk, but when you use conditional value at risk, it's, it's really good for automated trading. Um, statistical technique to measure and quantify level of finance risk within a firm or investment portfolio over a specific time frame. So what a lot of companies do, they'll, they'll run value at risk consistently and, and run it in many, many simulations. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to optimize their forecasting when they put on a variety of positions to get maximum return at that point. So they'll do a lot of um, a lot of simulations. Um, as as an example, um, there is a MATLAB script that does this. It's a really good application that will let's say you want to trade commodities only. It will do an assessment on past performance on let's say energy, and that would fall. Under, or what would fall under there are oil, energy, sorry, oil, natural gas, and any other type of product. Then there's agriculture, commodities, precious metals. And what this app will do is will analyze based upon, as I said, historical performance, and it will go out and calculate using a, a variety of mathematical techniques to bring back the actual, what it thinks is the percentage allocated amount of holdings for this type of um, 
commodity and this type of commodity based upon past performance, to, to, which will forecast um, uh, optimal return uh, or optimal, yeah, optimal profit um, for future trades and future positions. Make sense? If I'm not making any sense, just just don't be shy to type up in, in, in the chat box because uh, I am keeping an eye on it right now. Uh, I can I can uh, look up uh, an example of that um, application if you're interested. Uh, what I'll do is I've used MATLAB in the past, but I'm using more Python. I'm pretty well all in on Python, but there are some really good um, MATLAB application scripts that you can use. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with MATLAB, there's MATLAB Central and there's a commodity. Um, uh, they've changed this. Uh, I can't remember. It's called Portfolio uh, Analysis. And this is just another example of the kind of tools that you can use. Um, for for forecasting uh, your app for, for for your trades, so if you do use MATLAB, this is a great app um, and it's free. If you do have access to MATLAB, um, I can put the the, uh, the link in here. This is just one example of ones that I've seen that really work really well, um, and uh, this may work. I uh, don't know when the last update was. July. So you got July 2013. So I, I do remember this did break after a specific uh, version of MATLAB. So just to, just just so you know that. But if you ever wanted to play around with this kind of app, it's really good to get a really solid understanding of what I'm talking about when it comes to um, basically value at risk when it comes to your portfolio. And this is specific for commodity type of trading. Okay, anybody got any questions on that? Um, what I want to do is I want to move ahead on two really important areas. Uh, time horizon for portfolio. Um, I, I want to talk about this because it's really important. Um, a lot of us will spend probably months building out strategies for and models for trading. But what does get neglected in the process is portfolio management, portfolio assessment, risk assessment, uh, what I call risk um, reconnaissance in real time, and obviously risk management. And what I'm speaking of is if you have 100 grand and you just start throwing money out there, trades, and they lose, you're, you're basically, you know, you've heard that saying, how do you make a million dollars in trading? Uh, well, you start with $2 million and you don't want to lose money because I always ask this question. Let me ask you something. What do you think uh, is the goal in trading? I've just given the hint. Anybody have any idea what the goal of trading is? Everyone thinks it's money. It's not money. It's not making money. There's a more important uh, goal in trading. And uh, if you try to remember this, which is very important, You'll you'll be like us Canadians who are very conservative in our way of thinking, and it'll help protect your 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 portfolio. Anybody have any idea what the most important thing or number one goal in trading is? And as I said, it's not profit. Capital preservation, awesome. That's that's exactly it. Reduce your losses. It's actually capital preservation is the exact term, and that's exactly what you're trying to do with this with this risk assessment, risk management money management, portfolio um, um, uh, management as well. So I've been taught and I've built out a variety of strategies because I don't know if you've seen last week, I put up two very important Python scripts which are generating automated reports now. The first one I put up last week was one for uh, watching the Federal Reserve and forecasting which direction uh, the Fed may increase or uh, lower rates. And there's a variety of factors that you can use um, to to gauge that, and uh, that's one script that I put up last week. Uh, not not the, the not the script itself, but the report, and that's part of my quant analytics uh, membership. And the other one I put up on Thursday, I believe, which is really important for forex trading, is basically to measure volatility in the markets, and this can be used for real time. 
So what it will do is it will go out to IKEFI, download the latest amount of data if it's intraday. It can be any frequency, uh, tick data. It can be, um, it'll analyze tick data, uh, daily data, weekly data, monthly data. And what it does, it will measure um, volatility across different uh, Forex pairs. And it's really important to, to understand this because a lot of traditional, or sorry, say less, less educated uh, traders, what they'll do is they'll trade um, just the, the standard pairs, like the US dollar, Euro, US, and the British pound, and, and, and you know the major six currency pairs. But what the problem is, is that there's no money made in that. So what they end up having to do is to use a lot of leverage to get those returns that they want. And that can be somewhat a, a high risk because obviously if they're dealing with a broker that goes against them all the time or a corrupt broker, that's, a, that's not a smart way to trade. Whereas um, this script that I'm talking about, what it will do is it'll measure the most volatile scripts. As I said, in real time, over the last week, over the last day, over the last uh, few months. And it's a really powerful script because it will it will, it will give you hints of where the money's moving professionally and where uh, currency traders are putting their capital. And what was identified last week was there's a lot of uh, money being moved um, between the Euro and Japanese Yen. There's also m uh, money being made between the British pound and the Euro. And that's obviously due to the negotiations that just started last week between the UK and, and um, the uh, EU. So there's money being made there. There's also money being made between the British pound and the yen. And the other big one is the US dollar and the South African rand because it's not in the mainstream news, but there's a little, a lot of political unrest in the South African rand. So my point is that this script will identify all these highly volatile currency pairs, and that's where you can make money. It, it can be high risk, but there's a lot of factors that you can use to minimize that risk. And that's where you start using all this econometrics data that I was speaking of about the Fed, about the U.S. Fed. But I'm just going to be putting one out probably later tonight or tomorrow, uh, which does the same thing for uh, the Euro uh, community as well, the EC or the Union. And what it will do is analyze the entire um, major re uh, major um, areas in the economies of a lot of all of the major. Uh, European members, France, Germany, so on and so forth. And what it will do, it will, it, it's based using forward looking data. And when you use forward looking data, that is measured by some sort of set of associations or how the consumer feels or uh, the building or construction association for within that country. And they give gauges on how they feel over the next three months. Using that data, you can uh, basically. Um, uh, draw up what they call a bias on that particular country, which then gets um, uh, impacts the country's currency. And a good example is today, um, oil. Oil went down last week. Guess what happens? The, the Canadian dollar can get hit uh, pretty hard because our economy, our Canadian dollar is so heavily tied back to the oil price. And that's just generally a lot of economies are like that, like, like Australia as well. So my point is with these reports, you can you can use all these da this data and use it for forward looking um, uh, forecasts on your trades, and, they, and and you can use it for forex trading, for stock ETFs if that's what you want to use, and also uh, futures and options. So I just wanted to bring that uh, to your attention, and these are very three important um, reports that my system can uh, generate now and be used for forecasting direction in, in certain um, parts of the market. So where that leads to this is the important point of portfolio uh, risk assessment, portfolio optimization. And when I, when I talked about earlier about everybody focuses more on trading strategies, I did a survey a few months ago and everybody wants to um, have a focus on trading analysis uh, for forecasts. Well, the professionals, what they do with all these type of tools that I'm talking about, um, they use these tools to forecast where they're going to put on future positions, analyze where their portfolio is at, and the different goals that they set for their portfolio. So 
that's where they spend a bulk of their energy um, on, of their time. And usually about 80% of their time is focused in this entire area that I'm speaking about tonight um, on portfolio optimization, portfolio weighting, and, and risk uh, assessment of what the market's telling you. And there's so many data points that you can use, as I spoke of, the Fed, um, volatility in the, vol- in the currency markets, as well as um, in euro as well. But the other one I, I haven't mentioned yet is option option chain. And there's a lot of data you can get out of that. And there's another set of tools we can use as well. Uh, the COT reports, which is a commi- uh, commitment of traders reports. And we could talk about that in a bit. But the idea here is I want you to understand that this portfolio um, optimization is very critical for successful trading. And what you usually want to do is set goals for yourself and we spoke about it last week on segregating your trading account and your income account, like your day-to-day living account, and that's part of your wealth creation. So if you have an exclusive trading account just purely for, for trading, um, you can do quite well if you have a full understanding how to do this. And where do I get this information from? It's from professional traders. I, I, you know, I deal with a, quite a few um, hedge fund managers, um, and this is... This is the common traits that I'm seeing. So I'm just sharing what I'm learning. Um, so Brian says, I bet the pros hate you, Brian. Bringing in knowledge to us retail traders. I'm not sure that, uh, Brian, cool name. Um, but uh, it, it's not about what I know. It's just that the professionals are, are very secretive and they want to keep their edge. And there's two ways. They know what they know, they're experienced, and they keep their edge as well. Um on uh, with uh, the Bloom, you know, the Bloomberg Terminal Service, and that's like a a, a, a a paywall for them because us retail guys can't really afford five or twenty five grand a month for the terminal service from Bloomberg. So um, I've talked about it a few weeks ago, trying to mimic a lot of the functionality out of the terminal service. And again, you you have the capability to. Um, maintain the same edge that they have. So there's nothing secretive here. It's just a matter of sharing the knowledge. And there's other uh, trading guys out there, but their problem is they're so focused on the trading aspect as opposed to managing their portfolio because that's how you manage your account because that's why 90% of traders lose money because they don't put the emphasis on that. Whereas you're here to preserve your capital that you start with. In my case, which I'll start up a live trading account in a couple of weeks, I'm only going to put in 100 bucks because that's what I can afford to lose. And I'm going to go with um, Duca's copy and just do simple Forex trading. And if I lose, I lose. That's okay. But I'm not going to go in full blown with 10 grand or 20 grand and, and po- probably lose it in short order. I've talked about the club 90 90. 90% of retail traders will lose 90% of their money within 90 days. So we don't want that to happen to a lot of people, but you have to put the work in the investment and knowledge to understand this portfolio stuff. So um, I've done enough blabbing to try to emphasize that, and thanks for listening so far. Um, But there's a lot of tools that you can use, and I've already mentioned a few of them. Uh, The Kelly Criterion, I've also mentioned this value at risk. You can find them whatever your language is. If it's Python, there's lots of scripts to do this. There's actual packages that focus on this sort of stuff. Um, the other big ones is CAPM, but um, in the world of MATLAB, uh, the only really thing you really care about with CAPM is beta. Beta is just a performance metric, and you can use that as a way to measure your overall portfolio performance against some kind of benchmark, which is usually the S&P 500. And if you're beating it, you're doing pretty good. 80% of financial advisors don't beat the um, the uh, the um, the, the, the S&P 500, 80% of financial advisors are managing other people's money. But if you, you're able to beat it and then get your alpha, you're doing fairly well. So a couple of other tips I can give you. Um, the reason I put this long-term positions versus short-term, there's two modes when it comes to trading. Um, basically right now, you have long-term trading and you put in long-term investments or positions for like, I don't know, three week or no, you know, a week, a month, up to 90 days. Um, to, and that's what most human traders do uh, as to get a, a return on their, um, on their positions. But here's, here, here's the interesting part is because market regimes within the market conditions, 
we just came off of um, an upward trend, a, moment, a momentous type of trading period since Trump has, has won in November, and we're just starting to hit that peak. Um, I do a lot of Bloomberg analysis, and I'm starting to see overall that the markets are turning down. So a lot of the professionals are now looking at over overseas um, market um, markets. Like uh, I just put up uh, one on uh, um, I think Philippines is, is it was a good stock um, market to invest into. Last week I put in calls for Japan and sort of Saudi Arabia, but they may be. Um, decent um, exchanges to be part of uh, that will give you better performance of where at the s and is at right now. So if that's what a lot of professionals are doing right now, they're moving money into Europe. They just had, uh, I think it was like five or six quarters of money flow being put into Europe because they see better performance uh, in Europe than in the US. So that's the sort of thing that you're looking for is the better returns. So. Hopefully uh, you understand that, and that's why I do my um, my Bloomberg uh, analysis pretty well every day because I learn a lot from it, as well as I learn about what where where professional markets put in capital. And right now it looks like Japan, and I have confirmed it on Friday. Whereas I said with the, that volatility script for Forex, it does show there are the top five. Three of them were Japan, and um, a lot of money is being moved in, into Japan. So you'll start to see um, the Nikkei start going up and I'll start um, outperforming the uh, the uh, S&P. So this is the sort of thing you want to look for when it comes to portfolio analysis is to understand market regimes and understand how capital flows from one area of, of the world and, and, and going into another world that's called hot money and that hot money flows back and forth between regions and different asset classes as well. Um, it could move into treasury, and then it can move into stocks. Then it can move into uh, futures. It's just it, it, in, in country by country, it, it shifts, and that's what this portfolio analysis does. It enables you to um, analyze a variety of assets that you want um, to watch, and you can. Only, I'm only going to tell you, you can only do this with automation, because you can watch as many assets as you want, and a lot of firms and a lot of big traders like the multi. Millionaire guys are watching probably three, four hundred assets at once, and then they're, they're, as I said, they're running all these different simulations. So um, I want to show you a course that um, I've uh, looked at, um, and uh, if you go to YouTube, um, there's a course on here. Uh, it's from UC Davis. I've used this only. I've not really looked at anything else. And uh, if you do a search on UC Davis uh, Futures uh, Options course, in here what you'll find is a playlist of an actual course that UC Davis teaches. And um, basically, uh, actually there's a new series. Oh, they've uploaded with a new series. Okay, let me just go to the old series. Um, here, let me put the link in. So as I said, I'm going to put the link in here into the uh, chat box so you can uh, get you can uh, get that. Um, but there's different versions of this course. Um, I prefer the older one. So let me just show you this one. Okay, so basically this course has 25 videos. It's an as I said, it's an actual course, and this is the old one. So as, as I said, I'm putting into the chat box. This is a really powerful course, and I've looked at a variety of different ways to analyze the markets. I've had these same guys look at um, this course and, and ask for their opinion of it. This is how they trade, and if you want to learn how the professionals do it, you want to do it for free, put time into this course. It's an excellent reference. I've actually got one of my courses is, is built around this with the source code uh, for both C++ and um, uh, Python. But what it focuses on is uh, mostly futures and options. Okay, so that brings me back to here. 
uh, well, let me just uh, go back to this. In this course, there's a little um, uh, tutorial on understanding risk management and portfolio management. And what it does is part of um, understanding, basically understanding utility and money, typical risk versus reward. And it does a very detailed analysis of this. Um, there's a, a number of topics here we can cover when it comes to trading. Options pretty well is the lifeblood of all markets because in options, you have all the asset major uh, asset classes. You have obviously stock, you have um, currency, you have um, commodities, which obviously includes uh, agriculture, energy, and precious metal. And the other one is, uh, uh, I said currency, commodity, futures, options. No, sorry. Options covers a lot of parts, so let, 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 let me, let me uh, uh, take that back. But options is the lifeblood of the markets. There's so much data and so much information in options. And there's futures as well. Futures was invented in the 1920s when you know, for farmers and it evolved into electronic trading and then options came into play and options has somewhat made the electronic trading more complicated, but out of that comes a lot of different data, and that data can speak volumes to you in what traders are doing. As I said, there was a, um, an interesting topic uh, last week on Bloomberg, and what they said was, if you watch all the calls for options, the, uh, it, was a, it was a call set of calls going in for orders for ETFs um, uh, and, and stocks revolving around biotech, and the next day, biotech went up. So if you're watching this stuff, you can be about 24 hours ahead of what other traders are, are doing. And if you're watching the option chain, it's very, very useful. Um, but coming back to this course, um, there's this thing called put call parity, and it's a balance between puts and calls, and it's a parity that has to be maintained in the markets, kind of like the law of something in nature. And if one goes out, the other one kicks in and you can make calls if that if that parity put call parity goes out of out of whack um i'm just showing you different variety and, and you can you don't have to trade this but you can watch it and if you have access to this data you can watch it it's very powerful because you can use this as, again as part of your um forward indicators forward looking indicators and option chains a very powerful one so what comes out of that is everyone goes on about black shoals black shoals is, is it, um the key to the whole thing is a measurement of risk and one of the big areas in risk is is watching premium on options so if the premium gets too high there's a supply and demand check and if the pair if the if the premium goes too high what will happen is traders will not want to take on that risk. And this can be used throughout universally throughout um, all asset classes. So for instance, treasury is a great one because there's going to be always an auction for U.S. Treasury, which is U.S. debt issued by the Fed. And if there's not enough demand for it, that brings down, doesn't bring down the yield. The opposite effect takes place. The yield goes up. And that raises risk, and those guys that hold that debt want to get paid. So they're, they're looking for higher premium to get paid. And if there's not enough demand of buyers for that, Treasury can get hit. And it's that, those sort of things that you can use as a tool to analyze how your portfolio can, um, uh, can be used for forecasting. So this is just one example. Um, another one is hedging. Uh, obviously, the classic example is if you're an airline, uh, a large percentage of your cost will be um, measured by your cost. The big cost is usually going to be jet fuel. So in options and futures, they, can, they issue futures contracts where an airline is going to buy futures contracts and gas or fuel to hedge against if there's a spike in the cost of fuel. So you can use that hedging to protect your um, your operation and keep it profitable if you're buying 
uh, hedges of jet fuel. Uh, so if it does go up, you have a future contract to offset that, and that's the hedging. So again, when you watch these sort of things in all the different commodities, because I said hedging is used throughout all the major uh, commodities, and it's another tool that you can use in your portfolio analysis that can help protect you when bear markets come into play, if that makes sense. If, like I said, if anyone's got any comments on this, don't, don't, don't be shy. Um, I'm just looking for if there's any comments here. Uh, it doesn't look like it so far. But I'm just, I'm just spewing information out right now. But this course is very powerful. So you can learn about hedging. Um, you can learn about options and, and specifically around the Greeks where you have uh, delta, theta, and it's all measuring risk uh, in whatever option you're going to watch. And oh, I mentioned about black shoals. Black shoals can also be used as a forecast to measure premium on these option contracts. So once you know you can use the black shoals, there's different variations of it as well, to measure that premium, you can use that to give you a gauge on where the market may go because it's the options market that's going to be 24 hours ahead of where the rest of the market's going to be. And this is what the professionals are using, using options to sort of um, analyze that data before they go out and actually put a call or sorry, a, a buy up uh, an ETF or a stock in, in that particular uh, industry. And I've talked about commodities, how you can use as part of the value chain. And there's all this different value, um, sorry, different uh, types of um, uh, uh, risk, which is what we're trying to assess here. And it's really critical that you put more time into this versus the trading because you understand this. You, you'll have a better handle on your position management when you go out, instead of guessing what the market will do, you understand the fundamentals of what the market's doing. And all this data is yelling at you saying, this is what's going on in the markets a day or two days ahead of what actually happens the next day because of how the markets work when it comes to Asia or overnight options market or the overnight futures market. And it has an impact on the U.S. Um, markets the next day. Okay, so um, volatility is another somewhat big one. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about um, the VIX. The VIX is always measuring an aggregate of the was it top 50 uh, in the S&P, and that's in present, and it's an indicator of what's happening now. But you want to measure the volatility in the future. That's why you use like implied volatility. And this, this module, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and here you can use all these calls for arbitrage. So when you go out and actually put on trades, you can short one, do a long on another, and obviously profit off of that um, arbitrage opportunity. So um, there's a, a number of uh, topics here you can look at. Um, but the, the nice one is uh, the... The, 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 this one here, hedging risk versus return. And it will, you can use that to measure your risk and, and calculate the return. And then when you put on a position or simulate it, actually, if you know how to simulate it using automated trading to measure that risk versus reward. Um, because if you simulate it, and I showed you that MATLAB script with the commodity uh, trading, and you can pinpoint exactly the optimal optimal trade opportunity if you take on that position and not only that but you also have to factor how much of, of a position you want to take on how much capital you want to deploy and that's a whole nother world when it comes to position management so these are a lot of factors you have to take into consideration before you go out and make an actual trade because you want to measure that risk real important because what if you just if you're not doing this what you're doing is you're basically I hate to say it, pissing in the wind if you don't have an, a, a really understanding of these fundamentals of what's happening in the markets. And um, let me just go back to my uh, document here. Um, and uh, okay, just give me a yay or nay if you can um, see my, my uh, documents here. You can see my Word document, just give me a yay. Or just give me a yay that, oh, thank you, Word. Everybody's awake, I hope. Thanks, Brian. Okay, um, so here, 
we have here the Sharp and Sortino ratios. Everyone's heard of uh, Sharp. Uh, that's typically used to measure your portfolio, your strategy portfolio um, measurement over a certain period of time. And obviously that's how you get capital. If you have a decent so uh, Sharp of, I believe it's over two, you're doing pretty good. Um, and uh, I mean, nowadays, I wouldn't be surprised a lot of the banks are gonna ask, if you're a trader, we want to see your your um, trading broker account um, verified, and then they, they're able to measure your sharp ratio from it, and that's just the way of how they may say, okay, uh, we'll give you a job offer, or or yet we'll give you a job offer, but we want to see how good of a trader you are using your the sharp ratio on your trading account. So these are important uh, measurements for that. Now, the big one um, that a lot of people forget is this one, the Sortino. Um, let me pull up that definition here. Hang on. Uh, let me know if you can see my browser okay. Okay, I do have it defined here somewhere. Um, okay, let me just do another Google search. I like I like using uh, Investopedia because uh, it, it, the, the the definitions are very simple for uh, Luddites like me. Okay, so here's the Sortino ratio. I'm gonna pull up the Investopedia uh, one. I'm just gonna I'm not here to teach, but I'm just here to show you what you can use. Um, so it's like this it's like this sharp ratio. The only difference is, is that it factors in volatility because sh a sharp does not do that. So um, if you're really gonna me measure your own uh, portfolio, use, sort uh, use sharp, but don't forget about Sortino because it does include volatility and it's been forecasted that the markets will be very volatile coming soon it's coming soon to a town near you um and uh um you will have to use this as part of that measurement because the sortino can be kind of wonky but if you factor in with the sortino you can use that with the with the um with the uh volatility uh and here i noticed uh everyone's not getting my uh my chat stuff. Okay, I just put in the link for this in Vestopedia. Okay, let me just do a, a walkthrough of what we've covered. We've talked about sharp short sortino ratios, which are important. Any, let, let me ask, anybody got any questions or comments so far? Um, because I, I know I'm blabbing to myself here, and I know you guys are somewhat listening, and I appreciate that. But if you have any comments or concerns, let me know, and, and I'll try to cover them. So once again, uh, we've covered portfolio um, optimization. Um, I think we kind of somewhat, thanks that, Gordon. Uh, we still have the short term versus long term. Uh, that's what I was talking about, day trading mode. And all the examples that I've shown in that course, that futures and options course, where you probably will spend about 80% of your time, the markets will go into a day trading or a momentum mode, but 20% of the time over five years, 25, 20% of that on average will um, be some sort of momentum play for a couple of months, like what just happened recently. Um, and then you go into a day trading mode and you could get a monkey to throw darts at the markets and still make money. But the, but the idea obviously is to make optimal return, not just money. You know, like a 5% is, is great, but if you can do 15, go for it and uh, see what you can do. Um, so there is a chart I wanted to show the time horizon of, uh, time versus of, of, uh, time of your position versus the return. I'm just going to try to find that chart. Just bear with me here. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Okay. Anybody got any questions so far? Just let me know. Time versus money uh, chart. 
and that's uh, a uh, a uh, time horizon. Let's see if we can pull that simple thing up. Um, let me see here. But um, it, it's not an important chart, but what it will do is it will give you um, a simulated uh, return versus uh, on a certain time frame and a certain return. And as I said, you can run various uh, various uh, um, simulations uh, using value at risk and being able to measure uh, your your alt optimal position weightings. Um, and when you find that, then you go in and and when you deploy your capital, you'll you'll have a percentage of where you want to put your money in what positions for optimal return. So this time horizon helps you there and there's a variety of simulations that you can uh, use to do that. And I'm planning to uh, build that. I've also shown that in that MATLAB script in the um, commodity trading, but you could take what's in there and then di uh, diversify it by adding other types of asset classes, not just commodities, and maybe add in stock, Forex, and so on and so forth. It's very, very powerful. And it's just using statistics past performance and it will give you a, an overall simulated um, set of position weightings on where you can get minimal risk but maximum return. This is a set, sort of analysis you want to do on your portfolio analysis which will give you the, pos the positions and the weightings to give you maximum return. Um, so there, there's a variety of tools out there. Um, as I said, I'll be building that in part of my um, my analytics system, my service. I don't, you know, I, I there is source code out there, um, and, and I'm grabbing it from wherever and just modifying a little bit here and there, and then just repo, uh, reposting it for my own use, and then reposting it for my own um, members. So uh, I think we've. Oh, uh, one thing I should mention is I haven't mentioned here is uh, a very important one is uh, the commitment of trader reports. Th these are very powerful. A lot of people are not familiar with this. These are uh, known as uh, caught reports. And um, what it is is a commitment of trader reports from the uh, CFTC who oversee uh, commit, um, uh, what do you call it? The C CFTC. I can never remember uh, the organization what they stand for. Futures traders, basically, futures trader commission uh, in the U.S. and they have a weekly report that will indicate where money's going uh, for certain types of commodities. So um, let me download or uh, give you an example. Now the nice thing about this report is uh, you, there's some nice stuff you can glean from it. Uh, let me just pull it up here. Okay, so if you trade in commodities, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I want to show you something that really like blew us away. Um, if you go into bar chart and you look at volume of uh, future contracts, this is going to blow your mind uh, because I, I never knew this and I've confirmed it this morning actually. These are the most active uh, futures contracts. You'd think it'd be oil, gold, uh, some indices, but it was surprising it's not the case. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Okay, here it's just loading up the, the table. Okay, this is wild. So when you look at um, the futures contracts, which is again, the lifeblood of the markets, um, but when you look at, this is how bad the returns are in the markets right now. And again, this is what the professionals are using. Euro dollar is always the most, uh, has always the highest volume. Usually the mini for the Russell 2000, which is for the small cap, corn, S&P, soybean, wheat, uh, cattle, uh, wheat, soybean oil. See, my point is, this chart reflects the most highly 
highest volume of contracts on the type of assets that are being traded right now in the futures market. And it's all agriculture. Why? Because um, gold's down, oil's down, some will, well, the VIX is doing okay. Um, and this is where a lot of the capital is going because of this return. There's no other return out there. And um, these are future contracts that go out to, here we got September, December, August. So you can see what this is telling you, basically. <laughs> Professional traders don't feel good about our traditional assets. Typically, the markets, um, commodities, like uh, metals, energy product, it's all down. Even the financials are down. But they feel okay about um, agriculture product. And that's where they feel money will be. Uh, in, As I said, you have September, December, October. So a lot where they foresee the returns will be in the fall will be in agriculture. So again, knowing this, this helps you get potentially high rate of returns. But you won't hear about this in the news. You won't hear about this anywhere. But if you watch these kind of contracts um, and where the money's going based upon volume, you can use that as another way to factor how, how to measure your portfolio. So most likely you're going to put money into agriculture products um, and companies uh, uh, revolving around the agricultural industry, if you want to call it that. So knowing that, when you look at um, these reports here in the, in the commitment of traders, I bet you will find m majority of that money that's being deployed out there is going into agricultural products. And we could probably confirm that through this. I'm not going to go into it, but I'm just guessing here. Uh, so here we have um, the classifications and futures. Uh, we have agriculture, petroleum, or energy, petroleum, natural gas. Electricity is another form of commodity. Um, utilities is covered under that. So when the markets turn, there, there, there's a recession. Utilities are one of the better um, sectors to be uh, involved with because it's conservative. Everybody needs electricity, right? So this is a really uh, good one to know when the recession comes on and we know that it's probably coming. Metals and others, we just confirmed in the bar chart futures contract by volume, nobody's putting money into metals. And then there's the financials, which is the euro dollar, treasury, and um, other types of currencies, currency uh, futures, future contracts. So those are the financials. So these are the major um, categories. And you can learn that through that YouTube course I showed you at the UC Davis. This will uh, educate you through this. This is, this is how I know and can confirm this is how the markets work. And uh, this is where uh, if you, you analyze these sort of things, in your portfolio or simulate a portfolio, you can do quite well here, uh, knowing exactly where the money's going, where the money's going, that's where the profit and opportunity lie. So um, let me try to load up a, uh, a general report here. Uh, let's let's take a look at the uh, agriculture, so I'll download this report or the, the um, overall representation of it. Okay, any questions so far? I, I want you to understand, I, like I said, I'm not here to blab. If you, anybody has got questions or comments, let me know. Okay, um, Brian's got a question here. So stock traders can hold build watch lists for those categories and use those lists for that time of the year, like fourth quarter contracts, just as a head up. Actually, uh, Brian, that's a good point. You can do this any time of the year. Um, agriculture is obviously um, a seasonal trade because Everything goes into harvest come September, October. So there's going to be any time of the year will be maximum return will be at harvest time for agriculture products, especially grain, corn, and even some livestock. So that there's some seasonality there and you can trade off that. Or a good one is during Diwali uh, for India. Like I, I went through gold and where's gold getting exported to. Uh, just as an example, you could look at Switzerland. Switzerland's largest com um, export, 32%, and I know this because I looked at it today, uh, gold is the largest export coming out of Switzerland. 
They don't mine gold. They don't have a gold supply. But what's happening is Switzerland imports a lot of gold through, let's say, Gold Corp. And what they do is they'll fabricate the gold and then they'll resell it to the globe. Obviously, the biggest buyer will be China. But when I looked at it, it's not just China, but it's also India for Diwali, which is, I believe, sometime in the winter. And that's when people get married. They get married, they buy gold, and it spikes. And I've, and I've, and I've confirmed that. So it's another seasonal trade that you can use for gold. And all of the commodities will have some sort of seasonality to it. And it's also driven by basic supply and demand. So an example of back to grain, let's say, there's grain where there's storage. There's only so much X finite number of storage. So if there's an oversupply of, of, of grain or corn and there's not enough storage, a lot of that goes to waste and then the, that can drop the price of, of, uh, of, uh, of corn or wheat or whatever. So there's a, a very simple supply and demand, but that again, you can learn through that UC Davis course. And this is how the markets work. Um, so again, if I go through uh, the, the, the the commitment of trader reports, so here this is how the major headlines work. We have swap dealers. The swap dealers are the farmers, you know, the old old school guys that you know that were the market. They want to sell their commodity, corn or whatnot, in the nineteen ten or let's say nineteen ten, but they had no market. So the the, the Chicago um, uh, board of um, exchange was open, or I can't remember. It was it was a futures market in Chicago, open for farmers, and they were able to go to that market, sell their product, and get a return on it when it came to harvest time, and that's the historical, uh, the history of the futures market is from agriculture. So these swap dealers are those exact um, uh, participants in the market. Is, is a good way to put it. Uh, one of the big ones would be Cargill. They're a private. They're one of the largest private companies in the U.S. and they're a largest one of the largest um, commodity players in the U.S. They buy up a lot of farm product, kind of like almost a monopoly. And those are the kind of companies we're talking about. The merchants privately that are considered swap dealers. But here's the interesting part: the the managed money are the hedge funds. So the managed money is telling you what the hedge funds are doing. And hedge funds can be also used to say, we have a, a X amount of dollars in our portfolio, we want to deploy it somewhere. So you can watch exactly what hedge funds are doing. Managed money, the pension funds, the hedge fund guys. This is where the excitement is because here you get, guess what? The long and the short. So you know their forecasting is gonna be shorting time, come harvest time on corn. You, do, you follow suit, you short corn future contracts, or if they're gonna long on these particular products, you can measure here the number of positions. Uh, the open interest, when I talked about an options chain, open interest is another key factor you can use as part of your portfolio analysis, because when the open interest goes up for a particular option, that's an interest for that option, which means they have an interest in that product that they want to put positions on. And when that spikes, that means they're gonna probably deploy money or capital into that particular asset. So you can measure that through these reports from the CFTC. And that's on virtually on every major commodity. It's, it's powerful information. I think Cord has a comment here. When looking at the COT reports, you want to pay attention to where the smart big money show a different attitude to versus the retail money in the long and short exactly and when it comes to futures contract you you can watch the spread analysis as well in an option when the spread gets too 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 narrow you put money on if it gets too wide you take money off or you don't it's it's, it's a very simple dynamic but once you understand that dynamic from a fundamental point of view this is how the markets work, and this can be part of your portfolio analysis. As I said, you don't have to trade it, but it's very powerful to watch it because you can use this information to get virtually laser sharp like um, analysis in anything. If it's some kind of commodity, or a future, or 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 a commodity, or a, uh, a stock, or or even currencies, very powerful. Do I have scripts to scrub the data, Brian asks. If you mean to download the data, this is very simple data to, 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 to work with. Um, if you use Python, 
Um, there's uh, a way to uh, parse this data from this site here. I'll actually give it to you. This is just one aspect. Remember, this is just agriculture, and agriculture is the hot stuff right now, according to those future uh, volume contracts. I just put it into the uh, chat box, so you can you can uh, download this, load it in using pandas or numpy, um, and then parse away, and then you can build analytical scripts around that. Most of the caught come out weekly. That's correct. I think it's every Tuesday. They come out once a week, but it's a good way to watch where the hot money is going, specifically, uh, as as um, Gordon says, for the managed money, and that's the hedge funds, the pension funds. Now, um, the uh, Gordon mentions about um, the, the 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 pension fund guys or the hedge fund guys versus us little guys, the retail guys. You got to remember when it comes to retail guys, a lot of these guys are not going to pick up on this sort of information. Again, this is what the professionals are using, this type of data to analyze the markets and make forecasts off. But there's the little retail guys and they don't they don't care about this stuff. So they'll just be using their fancy charts and their little simple technical analysis and they're losing money. But they're providing liquidity for the professional traders to get out of positions. And that's, I hate to say it's a good thing, but it's, 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 that's basically what happens to the, the retail um, traders is that the futures traders or the professional guys, you see this stuff two to three months ahead. They've also got their Bloomberg uh, terminal services. They can see even more data because Bloomberg does a lot of research and a lot of other third parties will contribute that data back in the terminal service. We don't get access to it. But as I said, if we can somehow rebuild all that functionality with the data, we can build analytical scripts for that, and that can be used as your advantage. So what's happening is you're then able to make calls two, three months out through a future, through an option, and then you know you already know the opportunity. And the problem is, is that retail guys won't see it um, until three months out. But you know the mark that that commodity or that asset may may start to um, come back down. So then the retail traders will pile in when they're too late and they're providing you the liquidity and you get out. Um, and that's what a lot of the um, professional guys do. And that's what they call dumb money. It's the smart money versus dumb money. And the dumb money's from the retail traders because they just follow their little, their little uh, trading uh, charts and whatever platform they're using and they're getting killed. And it's these professional traders that see this stuff. So it's, it's very powerful to know this and to include this as part of your portfolio analysis. And you can, virtually every, any asset, you, you can gauge and, and forecast off of using all this data. Um, and this is what the professionals are using as well. And no different than what I'm talking about. And there's so many tools out there and data uh, that you can use. Um, for me right now, um, I, I use Ike feed. I, I think I've talked about it enough where I don't have to mention it. But I have looked at the pricing. You can get a, cheap, a very, very affordable pricing for futures data and options data uh, for like 50 bucks off the major exchanges uh, out, of, out of either New York or Chicago. And it's not very expensive. Once you have access to that data, you're now trading like a, a professional. Just people don't use it because they don't know what to do with it. But it's this data, it's very powerful. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about it. And you can use it to your advantage. And again, you can use it as part of your um, uh, portfolio analysis. Now, let me show you uh, another um, topic here in this uh, UC Davis course. Uh, let me see if I can find it. In here, one of the topics is, is very powerful. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know about, um, there's different types of professional trading strategies that they use as, as, as humans. What there is, is there's the typical, what they call the yield curve, right? The front end versus the long end. And there's a curve where if, if the curve steepens, where let's say a two year, five year, which is the front end, and then the long end, which is a 10 year, and there's a steepened curve, that's a good thing because that means the economy is strong. But once the economy uh, starts to flatten where the short, the two year, five year uh, yields start to go up, but the, the 10 year comes down, the yield curl, curve will flatten. 
When the cur yield curve uh, flattens, that means you're entering into a recessionary period. So when you're watching the two-year, five-year versus the 10-year yield for treasury, you can use that as a gauge to see if you're entering into a recession or into a, an expansion mode in the economy. Again, it's just another tool that you can use as part of your um, analysis. And uh, it's very powerful knowing all this stuff. And again, this, this stuff in here, um, if you're a currency trader, I'm just giving you examples. If you're a currency trader um, and you know about what they call, some they call interest rate differential, um, basically what that means is there's going to be hot money flowing from country to country to country. And we've already verified through the uh, volume, the, the futures contract by volume, hot money is moving into Japan. Why is that? Because Japan is looked upon as a safe haven. So what does that mean? Interest rates could potentially rise in Japan, which provides a higher rate of interest if uh, portfolio managers wanted to open up um, deposit accounts in Japan because now they're being paid at a higher interest rate versus U.S., let's say, because U.S. savings account interest rates are lower. So that interest rate differential on a global basis is what they call the interest rate differential. And that's another reason why certain uh, currencies uh, go up and down is because of that interest rate differential. When you understand something like that, um, there's, there's a, a pile of different types of trades uh, that come out of that. Uh, in, in temporal pricing theory is another one, uh, which, which is kind of like built around random walk theory. Uh, and, uh, you know, they say, well, the businesses are all cyclical. The economy is all cyclical. Yeah, it is. Here's the problem. If you know that everything's going to go into expansion mode, it's very difficult to time the low point. And when you do get the low point, then the next point is how do you measure that magnitude of that major potential upswing or the momentum of that upswing. And it's cyclical, but it's very difficult to be able to measure the low point of when to invest and when and how, uh, the measurement of that magnitude of the upswing to get out and then to start looking at other assets for a better return, if that makes sense. Anybody else got any questions or comments? Because this, this course is very really powerful to understand the, the, the basic fundamentals of, of the markets. And um, of all the things that I've seen, this course was the most powerful that I've seen. And as I said, there seems to be a uh, updated version of it. And then there's actually a book on it as well, uh, which I have, and that goes farther into understanding uh, the markets. So anybody else got any questions on that? And that's all part of your, what I call portfolio analysis. You don't have to trade it, you watch it. And that there's so many things there that will tell you uh, what's happening in the markets. Uh, SG, hi, how are you? If you got a question, just let me know. Um, so let me uh, just give you some other tidbits of uh, information here. There's so much you could, you could use. Um, just trying to think. So we've talked about yield curve. Let me go back to my uh, overall document here. Uh, just give me a second here. Uh, it's going to do a check off, do a checklist of what we've already talked about. Okay, so we've talked about Kelly Criterion. Just so you know, this is being recorded. It'll be reposted on uh, YouTube, so I'll be doing that later on. So we've got Kelly Criterion, uh, value at risk that we've talked about. We're not here to teach you it, but just you know of it. Um, and what it means. Um, beta, uh, SG's got a question, will there be a recap or replay? Yeah, I just mentioned that. It will be posted later tonight because this is being recorded. So you'll be able to catch the earlier part, no problem. Um, we've talked about option chain, um, the bid and call, or sorry, the uh, put and call <laughs> the, uh, of the bids. Uh, the, the, the uh, yeah, call and puts on the long run. And uh, you can do that also on a high frequency level too, uh, through Ike feed because they do have real time data, like tick data, which is very powerful if you do want to go to that level and uh, basically uh, take on those type of uh, trades. Um, I wouldn't do it at this point. I'm more of a, you know, like an intraday trader, but I, I like trends to see trends and, and holding on to positions, but I'm moving into intraday soon, very soon actually. 
Uh, we've talked about the long term uh, versus short term day trading mode, as uh, some will call it. Where, as I said, we've had the November election to now, just probably coming off the peak, and that's your day trading mode, and that's 20% of the entire cycle of a, a, an upswing to a low point or peak the trough and back again. Um, then we talked about the different performance metrics that you can use, the Sortino and the Sharp as well. Um, and the other ones I, I used, uh, this, this is a great reference, as I mentioned in the chat box that I posted for this, this course. It's very powerful to know. And uh, I think I'm pretty well potentially done, I think, for an hour and a quarter. Oh, and the, and the commitment of trader reports as well is also useful as well. Oh, and then also another one that you can use is ETFs themselves. Um, because what you want to watch is capital inflow and outflow of particular asset classes. Um, I believe ET, ETF DB uh, is one that, that has that sort of um, inflow outflow. Um, the screener. And what you're looking for is outflow and inflow of you know how, how an ETF like it's it's no different than an option call to be honest no different um, because uh, what it tells you is if let's say like I said we talked about biotech last week where biotech took off there was a lot of uh, calls put on the, the biotech uh, companies um, with uh, biotech but I think Thursday night and it just shot up on Friday and it's still going up healthcare was another one so the one that gets impacted by that is an ETF that focuses on the uh, the uh, the biotech. Let me see if I can pull that up actually, just to give you as an example from last week. Uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, <clears throat> of the ETF for biotech. Let me see if I can find that <clears throat> the performance of it. PBE. No, there's another one. RF. Um, let me just see. I think. It was a different one, maybe. Um, IBB, that's the one <clears throat> that I want to look for. That's the big one. And uh, when I went to a lot of trader um, conferences, uh, let me see if I can look up in the ETF. Uh, so let's see the performance of it. Okay, so here it is. And you'll probably see that the um, portfolio has done quite well, or the ETF performance has been pretty strong since uh, Friday or Thursday. Let me just try. Um, so we know. Let me just go to Yahoo Finance. Give me a second here. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay, where's my quote? IBB. Okay. Today would be nice. Uh, hmm. Yeah, just so everybody knows, IBB has been an absolute Yahoo Finance <clears throat> has, has been really bad. So if you want a tip, I use Market Watch, which has been pretty good. So we want IBB Biotech. Let's see what the chart says. So IBB Fund. Here we go. Let's take a look at the one day, couple day charts, like a five day or something. So, so you can see the move up. Uh, it's a one day. Let me pull up a five day. You can see Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It just right here. It actually, was um, yeah, that was on Wednesday when that move moved up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Eeps. Yeah. So let me know when I'm. I'm. I'm not not sure when I should be. Okay. It's still showing the document. Okay. Can you guys see my my browser here? Okay. So I'm at uh, Market Watch. Thanks for letting me know that. Okay. So here we go. Uh, Wednesday is at uh, let's say 350. Now it's up to 320. So it's gone up, not a lot, but in two, three, 
they move. That's almost a 10% move in two, three days. And um, if you looked at the um, options market for these, for, for biotech, it, it just spiked on Wednesday. There was no reason for it. Um, maybe some kind of uh, industry news, but it went up. And if you're seeing that in the options market, um, you're ahead of the game for a lot of traders, retail traders. Um, and if you see that as part of your portfolio, you know that's a good opportunity right then and there and you dive in and you can instantly get a nice 10% uh, uh, um, return in, in a few days or close to it. And I forgot one thing I should be talking about. Okay, let's, let me pull up my uh, document here. Okay. Okay, very important. Can you guys see my document now? I forgot to talk about this. It's a very important topic. Okay, we, I touched on this last week. Okay, so let's say you have $1,000, okay? Right? Forgive me on my butchered diagrams here. I'm not very good at it. But you want to get, let's say, a $2,000 or a $3,000 account a year from now, right? So what you got to do <clears throat> is um, basically... Uh, figure out your return that you want to have for the year. So if you go, let's say you want to make a, you want to double it from a thousand to two thousand dollars, let's say. So what you got to do is you got to obviously do two thousand two hundred and forty days or trading sessions of the year, which gives you anybody got got a calculator? Hang on, I'm just going to pull up a calculator. Uh, so just give me a second here. I'm going to pull up a calculator. Something's going on on my Mac here. If anybody can... Okay, so you won't see what I'm doing here, but what I'm doing is I'm just basically... Yeah, hang on, let me just do this. I'm going to do a new share. Just give me a second here. Yeah, so let me just verify that. Thanks. Uh, uh, so we want to go from a thousand dollars, okay, to two hundred forty. So that's how much of a return every day we got to get, right? So if we divide that and figure out our daily target on the overall portfolio, we have to get upward swings or shorts, but that percentage of daily movement to achieve that goal. So that's really important. Usually um, the, the, the conservative way of doing it. Ooh. Okay, so are you guys still there? I just pushed the wrong button. Okay, so let me go back to my document. Are you guys still out there? You guys still there? Just give me a yes. I want to make sure everyone's uh, okay. Cool. I pushed the wrong button. My oh, hang on here. I almost canceled the meeting. Uh, hang on here. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. As I said, doing this sort of thing on a laptop's crazy. Okay. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to factor. How much percent moves do we want per day, per trading session? And that's our target each day. Okay, so let's say we want to get a day, a daily moving uh, swing in somewhere. So let me go to um, Market Watch, just the overall markets. So you can see here at the top um, in the Market Watch, we have uh, US, it only moved. Uh, what seven not seven percent point zero seven but we would like to see some asset classes give give us a nice one percent move at least Share that. screen again Brian. what's show, that show screen oh I'm sorry yeah thank you I'm sorry I keep forgetting about that okay can you guys see it now 
Okay. Um, okay. So uh, thanks for, for that. Okay. So if you look here at the rates or the percentage of moves, what you're looking for here uh, as an example is if you shorted FE, whatever that is, or EQT, that's a 5% move down. But if you sh forecasted it, you know, you, you've exceeded your 1% move. Um, and that's important because um, I'm going to give you a tip out there from somebody who's probably the best trader that I've known out of London. And I'll just give you that as a hint if you've known me for a while. But what he said was, if you want to protect your ass, your, your portfolio, you got to factor in what you want to set as a daily target move. So if you want to set 1% and you have, you, you know, you do your trading and blah, 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 blah. And as soon as your capital, your portfolio that you set for that day hits that target, you stop trading. Why? Because you've hit your target. And if you keep doing that each and every day as the tightest risk management there is, you will be able to preserve your capital. You will not lose money. Why? Because once you hit your daily target, you get out and you stop trading for the day. Okay? And next day, you try to hit your target again, your daily target, and you keep doing that. And what you're trying to do, as I mentioned last week, is you take that profit and you put it back into your trading account. Because what happens is when you start to build your one day percent moves, you're now building out your account size and the, with the power of exponential it grows very quickly that's how you know compounded interest works same thing with this so the goal here is to meet that daily target and get out once you reach that target and stop trading for the day and you restart again for the next day and try to get one percent if you're setting one percent as your daily target and that's how you're able to preserve your capital Okay, and that's why a lot of these, these gurus go, well, you could trade for 20 minutes, 50 minutes. It doesn't take much to get a 50% move or 1% move on your, your goal on whatever you're going to trade on. And there's a lot of um, assets out there that will actually exceed it. Um, but it just depends upon your forecasts. Um, but that is one of the more critical points of trading. And a lot of guys don't, don't know this. And because that's one of the other reasons why they lose is because they don't understand that there is a system here. There's a strategy. We want to make X amount of dollars, reverse engineer how much return you want, and break it down by day. And then once you, every day, you get that daily target, you get out. Because this is what happens is you get that daily target and you keep trading for the day. Most likely, it comes off, and now you're below your target, and you may think, ah, oh, this is where you start gambling. And you don't want to do that. It's about process. And once you have that process in place, specifically if you're using automation, you get out, you follow those rules, you follow that logic, and you don't break it, ever. And once you hit that daily target, you stop, go again at it the next day. Because once you involve your feeling and this intuition, as humans do, you're going to lose money. And that's, if you just go to a casino, and you'll know what I mean. Um, yeah, and exactly what Brian's saying here. Uh, day, he says, I know day traders that do that. Everybody does it. It's only human, um, it's, it's the human way. <laughs> it's not the way to do it. It, it. Trading is about process. And specifically, if you have um, the automation and the rules in place to stop that trading, you'll be fine. And that's a, the tightest type of risk management you can have. And again, when I talked about Kelly Criterion at the beginning, where you allow your system to throttle your account, your, your, your capital to you, and, and you let that Kelly Criterion process manage your money, and how much it will deploy it to each and every day, you're also protecting your account as well. So hopefully you get into a winning streak. And you know, you, if you get, let's say, 55 or 60% wins, your, your capital uh, uh, limits are raised each for the next uh, time period or next trading session. And that's what the Kelly Criterion is all about, is, is to manage your money automatically. And if you could set your trading system around that, you'll be pretty good. Another question. Um, cool, this is good because this is what we want is, is the uh, discussion here. Like I learned from it and this is great. Thanks, uh, Brian. To calculate many ratios, you need win ratios, profit per trade. What do you do with positions uh, you're holding include or exclude them from the calculations if I only use my closed positions to evaluate my portfolio 
it could take a long time to get me meaningful measure. Well, this is the question you should ask yourself is, basically, hopefully this doesn't happen to you, but let's dictate reality. Let's say you do put on positions that you think that your system or whatever you're using will give you this type of target and these kind of forecasts, um, and they don't for whatever reason. If th this is where the position management comes into play, um, I could do another separate webinar on this. This is um, pricing action and position management. There's, 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 there's some formulas you can use on position uh, management. And it's basically, when it comes to stop losses, uh, what you're gonna do is, is, is a simple formula you can use to calculate that your dynamic stop loss. And then there's also what you call your target stop loss. Now, first thing you don't want to do is tell your broker all this information because once you signal back, you're putting on a stop loss, you're telling your broker that your stop loss is going to be this, and guess what happens? They'll have computerized uh, processes that will work against that position, so you lose. When you lose, they make. Okay, there's so many other areas that brokers make money in. This is what a lot of corrupt brokers do. That's one thing you need to be aware of. But when you have your own virtual system that is tracking your stop losses, your stop losses, once they hit on the downside and you have that dynamic target and it gets hit, you close the position. Because therefore, once you, you're not hanging on to those positions that are going really bad for you, you minimize your loss. So that's one way to do it. And that's another whole uh, area that we, you could talk about. And I've covered that in various past um, online events, but you 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 set two two things: your your virtual stop loss, your hard stop loss, and then your target. And then there's another part of your portfolio is you can roll on, or sorry, put on half positions or or full positions. So say you feel good about a position that will go up, you don't have to put on a full position. Let's say hundred dollars worth, you can put on fifty dollars worth. So you put on a half position, and if the position works in your favor where the profits run, then you start adding to from a half position to a full position. And then because you have a dynamic uh, stop loss and a, and a soft target, once you break that, you start adding on more positions if it's going up. But there's a whole variety of, of processes you can run on that position to, to calculate the probability of that asset coming off. And you can use all the things that we've talked about. Um, in the past, in like tonight, just alone from that. So that's what you want to do is you want to have a, a methodology to manage those positions and, and manage those virtual stop losses, not an actual stop loss that you signal back to the broker. Um, you want to do it virtually and have that system running. And once that stop loss is hit, the virtual one, you get out. Um, and of course, there's certain conditions that you, you can't control if the markets are tanking. Um, you may not be able to get out, but you're already way ahead of the curve. You're trying to forecast these kind of moves. So part of your risk says, no, don't trade today. We're not having, it's a risk off day, don't trade. And maybe trade something safer, like Forex as an example. So there's different ways to go about that. Uh, that's a good question, Brian. And, and there's ways to do that. Um, I think I got it covered in, um, if you do actually a search. Can you guys see my browser? I, I, I don't know what... Uh, let me just pull up my uh, sure. Yeah, you can see my browser still. Okay. So, um, yeah, let me just. Uh, okay. So, if you go to my YouTube channel at the Quant Labs and you do uh, a search on it, let me just show you how to do that. It's coming into my uh, YouTube channel, the main page. Actually, the easier one is just go to youtube.com, Quant Labs. And here you have this little search. I'm going to shut myself off. Hang on. Here's this loads. Okay. Shut up myself. Okay. So if you look up positions uh, in, in here, I cover this topic. Um, my Meet my new pricing position manager with auto stop loss with a target. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and that's really powerful to have as part of your arsenal. Uh, in your automation, um, a lot of platforms don't do this because they're they're relying and just signal back to the broker a stop loss and it tells the broker what your stop loss is and if the broker is not 
um, a less, or we'll just say is or isn't a corrupt broker, that can work against you. And um, just so you know, I had a comment I put up on my Facebook um, about somebody asked about interactive brokers. And a lot of people don't know this, but interactive brokers had a marketing making division uh, called Timberhill. And uh, they just sold it a, about a month ago. And they sold it to two, uh, Sig uh, two Sigma, Sigma two, two Sigma. And that's one of the bigger high frequency trading shops. And what that tells me, uh, potential. I'm not saying they, they're doing this or not. And I hope nobody in the rap, rap brokers don't don't see this or watch this. But as a warning, um, there there was accusations of if you had let's say Scott Trade accounts, what Scott Trade would do or another broker is they would sell order flow back to high frequency trading shops. So you put your order out, uh, you put your stop loss. And that little information is then resold to a high frequency trading shop. And the HFT shop knows your stop loss. So they go into market making, blah, 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 do their business, get, a, get, get some, uh, 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 what do they call it, uh, uh, skin off, off, the, uh, off the position, uh, resell it back to the broker. And uh, yeah, they're reselling your um, order flow to these operators without you knowing it. And uh, those operators are working against you through the broker and that will impact your trades and your positions. And that is because you're telling the broker and signaling to the broker that you are putting um, positions on with stop losses and those are called uh, stop hunting. So if you look up on Google stop hunting, um, a lot of the retail trading world is wising up to that and that's what um when fxcm got busted a few months ago that's what they're doing and that's what they're accused of is that they were going against uh the trades of their own customers and the cftc basically stopped it and shut them down up and shut them f uh, down from operating in the u.s and they were the largest um forex broker in the world and the retail trading world doesn't know this stuff and the less you provide your broker, the better. And stop loss is a big one that the brokers love. Um, and uh, you got to be very careful of that. So Brian says, yeah, I canceled all my stop orders and tracked them in a spreadsheet with Google Finance. We need every edge we can get. Yeah, exactly. Um, but if you're a developer or programmer, um, you can do that through um, like simple stuff using Python. Um, like you can funnel your orders and execute your orders to the broker through an API that they provide. Exactly. Um, but you don't have to let them know about this particular type of order and at the same time say, I'm going to put on a stop order at this percent when the position goes up or down, get me out. And you're telling your broker that, you don't need to do that. You can do it virtually. And the less they know, the better it is to your advantage. I have um, a video here. Um, you may want to watch called uh, Forex Brokers. We'll just type in Forex Brokers. Screw you. Um, let me just find it. There, there's a video I put up. Um, basically, six ways your uh, Forex Brokers screwing you. And I've got people from regulators that confirmed it. And there's a comment from somebody on that. Um, and uh, yeah. It's something to be very aware of what the retail brokers do. Um, and now that Interactive Brokers sold off their market making division, I'm not saying they do it, but it's something to be, it's a red flag to me. That's all I'm going to say. And I do, I can tell you when you get Forex brokers at the retail level, I'm not going to name names because I don't need the, the lawsuits, <laughs> but um, you gotta, there's two, two red flags you need to be aware of is if they support only MetaTrader and if they're in a weird country like Cyprus or somewhere in the Caribbean, which means they are skirting the regulation uh, uh, because the, the broker's not being regulated. So I had a meetup last week and one of the big brokers that I thought was good um, told that person, says, well, hey, if you want to fund this account, you have to put money into this Malta account. It's not done out of the UK where they have to be regulated. They want their those deposits made in Malta. So that enables them to skirt the regulation. 
And because of that, they can screw you. And FXCM was doing it. And I don't know if you remember the, the Swiss National Bank, when the Swiss National Bank depegged from the euro, the, the franc depegged. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose for two or three days. And about six brokers went bankrupt. Forex brokers went bankrupt. And they went bankrupt for a variety of reasons. One, they had crappy uh, risk management. Um, the other one was because uh, they didn't know what they were doing and they never foresaw this. And the, the, the broker went bankrupt. When the bro broker goes bank bankrupt, your, 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 your account basically vanishes. So you're basically pissing money away. And uh, if you got like a ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars in these kind of brokers, uh, I'd reconsider your broker. <laughs> Just to be aware. Um, and again, this is portfolio analysis, I guess you could say that a lot of people don't talk about. But again, I'm not here to talk about the broker themselves um, because uh, I, I I could, you know, get in, in the legal trouble, which I won't say. But as I said, the two the two um, red flags are. If they only support MetaTrader, uh, MT4 or MT5, and where they're based out of, or where they ask you to deposit their their um, their capital, your your capital. If it's in Malta or uh, Latvia or uh, somewhere in the Caribbean, run or Panama, because there's no regulation there. That's why they do that, and uh, be very very careful on those kind of brokers. Interactive brokers is fine. Um, Duca's copy seems okay. Um, supposedly, if you have five thousand Swiss francs, you can you can deposit it into the Duca's copy uh, Swiss side, which is then within the regulations of Switzerland. Which means they, um, the Swiss government will protect you if Duca's copy does go bankrupt. For let's say, and the Swiss government has to step in, and actually, that's better better protection for me, even as a Canadian, because. Um, my bank account's only protected up to $100,000. Any kind of investing, I'm not protected. But if I take that same capital, put it into Switzerland, right off the bat, supposedly I'm, I'm protected by the Swiss government if the broker does go bankrupt, which gives you pretty good protection. Uh, so that's why I, when, you, when you see me in the next couple of weeks go with Duca's copy, that's probably the big reason why I'm going to go with them. And if you're not, and, and I just so everybody knows, the Duca's copy, don't take Americans. Um, there is a British one, and um, I'll just use, say, the term, uh, well, there's LMAX, um, but I did talk about a previous broker about putting money into Latvia. Uh, hopefully, it'll get two and two together there. Um, uh, but Duca's Copy is one of the cleaner brokers for retail Forex brokers um, because of the Swiss thing that they have. But the other problem is um, if you don't have 5,000 uh, Swiss francs, you put it into um, into Latvia. And again, that's another red flag. Um, so I'm starting small. My strategy is this. Starting small, 100, I'm not sure if it's 100 euro or Swiss franc. I got a, a minimal amount. Gives me access to the data. Gives me access to the J4X platform. Start trading it through these scripts that I'm speaking of. And just play around with $100. See how the trading goes. And try to scale up a, a set of... Um, algorithms and strategies that are consistent um, and once they get that then I'll start scaling up the account to something again that I can afford to lose maybe a thousand dollars and then go from there and then let's say I, I, I get yeah, I don't know, like ten thousand dollars a ten thousand dollar account and then I'll move it to interactive brokers that's that's the plan and just start out simple with Forex uh, um, because all this stuff I've already talked about can be applied easily to Forex trading no matter the size of the account it's it's all about watching data watching econo economic econometric data is is the key and then as i said once you understand the economy of that com a country and watching the trading what they call the balance of payments between countries you can get a, a an overall bias between those two countries which means you can trade those currencies between the two countries Again, a good example is the U.S. and Canadian uh, dollar. That there's a almost a correlation between that and the um, the uh, the uh, 
uh, uh, oil price because Canada is so dependent upon oil. That our, like our economy in Canada is, uh, is commodity based, which is oil. So whatever oil price does, the Canadian dollar follows in suit. And no different between Australia and, and China, the Chinese yuan, where Australia provides a lot of commodities to, ch to China, um, iron, copper, uh, coal, and uh, depending upon the import levels that uh, China imports to from Australia, uh, that relationship between the yuan and the Australian dollar is impacted by that, specifically the Australian economy because they're so dependent upon commodities as well as imports or exporting to China and that has a great effect on the Australian dollar. So understanding these type of relationships is really powerful. And again, you could put that as part of your portfolio analysis when you do put on those positions. Simple, eh? Well, that's simple, but there's a variety of things and patterns that you can look for. But what we talked about tonight is a very powerful set of data that you can use. Alrighty, uh, I'm, I'm not. I, I can shut up now. Anybody else got any questions at all? If any, I'm not sure who's online, but uh, um, let's see. We got uh, Friday, Brian, uh, Eric, Gordon, Richard, SG, Shalom, Jojo, and RF. Uh, thanks for uh, watching. Anybody, anybody got any questions right now? I can answer on whatever. Trading patterns, uh, what I've talked about tonight. Um, next week, what I'm going to be talking about is last week I did an introduction of one of my reports on the Federal Reserve and what it's doing and what to look for. Um, I'm hoping to get some better scripts uh, available in Python to do a complete analysis on the Federal Reserve and that from there you can gauge uh, a variety of things. Uh, the U.S. economy, it's an amazing snapshot in full detail with the U.S. economy. And it's all forward-looking data. So I can cover that next week as part of, well, it's part of the um, Independence Day. So it's a good tie-in. <laughs> um, and then um, another uh, week I can introduce you the Forex script uh, that I spoke of earlier about the volatility of the different pairs. Uh, I have a video on it, and that can show you um, the uh, basically the higher volatility uh, currency pairs, and um, that's that's powerful information. So instead, if you're just a forex trader and just trading the six majors: euro, U.S. dollar, Canada, U.S. dollar, British pound, Swiss, all of those, where you're not making a lot of money. You could be putting money into higher volat volatile uh, pairs, and where there where there's risk, as you could say, because it's volatile, there's opportunity, and that's where you can make good money uh, in forex trading, looking for those economies or uh, those those uh, currency pairs. And right now, as of Thursday, Friday, it was a Japanese yen that was the volatile one, as with um, the Swiss, uh, sorry, with the um, South African rand and. The other one that was not surprising is the euro and British pound, again, because of the negotiations between uh, the euro and the UK. It, re it impacts that, that currency pair. So I can do an, another analysis on that in a couple of weeks as well. Um, and I know uh, Shalom wanted to present something in a couple of weeks as well. He's online tonight as well if he wants to chime in on what he wanted to present. But uh, there's a lot of stuff I can present. Um, as I've said earlier in the year, I want to focus more on trading instead of automation. There's so many places to go to get free um, courses online. Uh, sorry, for Python, let's say, or whatever language R, um, and it's all free. So I've, I've said it, uh, months ago, I'd be getting out of that and focusing more on trading, and that's what I'm doing now. But I am using these reports, which are generated by my systems uh, and, and, and doing analysis on those reports because that's basically what I use to gauge forecasts and eventually those positions that I speak of for, for trading purposes, obviously for you know profit. We're not here to lose money. But I'm using these reports myself for my own trading. And some of the calls that I had was J the Japanese Nikkei, um, uh, the Saudi Arabian... Uh, index, I can't remember the name of it. it. Was was two I said last week, 
uh, Japanese yen's another win because everybody sees the markets coming off in the U.S., so they're all moving to Japan because that's the safe haven, as well as the Swiss franc. But the other one that um, I've just proven tonight on bar charts with a futures volume, the other area that's being made is in agriculture. Um, let me pull up that uh, chart um, right here. Uh, can you guys see it? Just give me a yay and yay. And then we talked about it. All the different um, uh, commodities right now, the hot ones is agriculture. Sugar, live cattle, coffee, cotton, cocoa. Because there's no return anywhere else. Everything's getting hit, killed, basically. Oil, gold. Um, the markets, like right now, the S&P is not doing too well. It's in, a, it's, in, it's in range bound for the last couple of weeks. I don't think it'll break out. It'll probably drop. Um, you know, and the only one, maybe VIX, but that's a temporary thing, right? Um, but for more consistent type of trading, it's these agricultures that are doing fairly well, I guess. Anyways, I've done enough blabbing. Questions, comments, let me know. Uh, anybody? <laughs> oh, no problem, uh, Brian. Thanks for the uh, overview and the useful takeaways. I try to do that every week. Um, as you know, I do the videos as well. Um, people are telling me I shouldn't put up my video playbacks because they're so valuable. And what happens is people know they're coming out, so people don't come out live. And then it takes away the conversation that I'm trying to engage people on their opinions on professional traders and what they're doing. Um, that's the value of these. Um, no problem, SG. Uh, anybody else got any comments or questions or anything? Uh, so we can, uh, uh, you know, I don't mind talking. Uh, if you have any other opinions, I've, I've given you some calls that I'm thinking are, are going to be happening. No problem, RF. Yeah, go ahead, uh, SG on the blog. Um, that's cool. If you want to unmute yourself, that's cool too. If you want, what's the comment you have? Is it awful? Really bad? I tried to modernize it a few months ago. Let me know what you think of the blog. I won't be insulted. Honestly, I won't. <laughs> I think it's not as good looking as it could be. Um, you're probably right. Um, I'm not sure what you define as a good looking blog. If you can give me an example, I can work off of that. No problem, Eric. Um, hopefully uh, uh, that was useful. So let me know, SG, what you, if, as an example of what you think is a good looking blog. Um, before we uh, tear away, I just if you come into the product, um, as I said about the course, the future course, uh, I've got uh, this course here, which I've talk, talked about with the source code for both. Um, give me a sec, uh, SG, I'll uh, get to you in a little bit. So I've got this course here, the futures uh, and uh, option strategy course. I've broken out everything. So there's my membership and everything used to be included in the membership. So I've broken out in the standalone product. And if you're interested in just trading overall, just, just to build out your own trading system, I got this one as well. Uh, Python, the, the components that goes in an algorithmic based trading system. Uh, so I have that. And then also I've got the membership I spoke of, the quantitative analytics as well and it's a monthly thing and that's growing and then a lot of this stuff will go private what I'm showing um, and that's also going to be more specific on actual trading and over time uh, once I can build up enough um, members that are active I'm hoping to build a live trading room out of that I've got all the technology in place for that and then as I add more value obviously the price goes up so you may want to take advantage now because everything gets Grandfather, I did a one half price of what's currently a few weeks ago. Okay, let's go back to SG. Um, I think a little of good stuff is hiding, but info is not readily available. Look at Hurricane Capital or the Base Investing blog. Both have great layouts that you could copy. Okay, hang on here. Let me um, Google that. Okay. I'm going to actually uh, note that. That's good stuff. Thanks, SG, for that. Appreciate it. Um, it's going to make a note here of these blogs. Okay, and let me just uh, Google over to one of these uh, blogs here. Uh, okay, and I'll give you probably a bunch of excuses on why um, I have what I have. Okay, I probably may have a solution that you probably aren't aware of. Hang on, Brian, I'll get you back to your comment. Okay, so I'll just bring up the uh, Hurricane Capital. 
Um, are you talking about each posting SG um, in terms of the headlines and stuff? Because mine is totally different from uh, like Quant Start's a good example because all my articles are very short um, and there's a lot of content there. Um, I work totally differently than most people. Like I don't give full thought and then type something out. Um, I just put up little blurbs as I go. And um, let me just see here. Investing, both have great layouts that you could copy. Okay, let me go back to my website. And this is the book of excuses I'm going to give you. Um, here. Okay, so I load up the blog here. Okay. All right. So if you come into my blog here, how I've got it, obviously you got to have the email part. But if you come under here uh, and you want organization, I have the most popular and more recent articles. Um, what I'm doing with my blogging now is totally different. I'm not blogging as much. I, I used to blog 10 postings a day, so it overwhelms people. But I might do one or two, maybe three a day. And it's very small, but I'm posting more video than actual content. Um, the idea is all my bigger stuff for analysts gets put behind my paywall because I got to eat. You can see I can barely afford the lighting here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's probably why I do that. Um, so hopefully you understand that. Um, and I've got over 1,500 videos. And I just had a comment last week where there's too many videos. I go, yeah, well, that's because of seven years of videos. I mean, if I'm doing, I was doing a video a day. And I'm actually doing a video a day. You just don't see them. It's part of my membership. So um, I, I, I'm very cognizant of overwhelming people. And I'm trying not to. Um, but it's trading. It's data. And uh, I could easily do that uh, where I don't want to overwhelm people. But it's kind of hard to balance that. Um, so work with me, I guess, and, and, and I hear you. Um, I've looked at your, your suggestion here, and the see here I've got uh, the actual articles, and you just click on whatever one you want. I don't know if that helps you out. I think it truck with a cleaner web design, just my two cents. Um, yeah, let me, let me get into it, because I just did this uh, a few months ago. I just did a redesign. The only one that's overwhelming <laughs> is the blog itself and it's a traditional blog I've got over 10,000 postings on it now so um, it, it's more like you have to figure out how to anal how to use it with the, with the search bar here and know what to look for but my my honest view to really be part of it this is a community we've got the Facebook group which I know some of you have come through um, we've got 10,000 members in the programming one uh, I post everything on that group so there's engagement there. We get comments, which is good. But if you're here to learn, come to these. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about what I've already talked about as I go. But what I'll be doing moving forward is talking about what may have happened in the last few days and my view of it and as a trading opportunity. So it's a good way to learn as we go as, as a community. And as I said, it's a community. It's an audience. And what I really depend on are guys like you to give me the feedback so I can properly... Um, uh, properly uh, adjust what's needed. And I'm currently doing that in a variety of things. And that's why I program in Python, because I did a survey and that's what people want. Um, and that's what the language I focus on, the programming language I focus on. The other thing is I ask people what they want in terms of trading. People want to understand about forecasting and how to do that and build models. That's the most, so I'm more focusing on that, even though I know down deep inside, that sort of helps, but you got to understand what I presented tonight to really do well in the markets. And the only way you know that is by coming to these events and participating and engaging or watching because you only get a small portion of it. You can't read it throughout the whole block because there's a lot of moving parts to this. Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. It's just hard to explain. I understand about the, the cleaner look, but if you want to email me, we can do it back and forth and maybe you can help me out on that. Okay, so Brian had a comment of, I built an auto trading program using VB6, my sympathies. It's a hard, that's a comp. To do that in, in Visual Basics, pretty tough. Using interactive brokers back in 2000. Well, I mean, that's all you had. I may take the Python plunge soon, and I know where to, where to go to get me started. Okay, let me, let me mention something about Python. Um, I did a survey about 
a month ago. And what I found was over 40% of all the people that wanted Python. And I posted another article that confirms that Python is everywhere. You can't escape it, specifically around trading. A very easy language to pick up. Um, even in MATLAB, which I absolutely love, than Java, C++, C Sharp, all that, you can do more in Python um, than in any other language. You can do more in less. In three lines, you can do a lot that would tip typically take you a couple hundred lines. A very easy language to pick up. And it's the language that you really only need to know when it comes to automated trading. And that's the modern way to do it. Um, also, uh, uh, I mean, the community in Python's huge. It's absolutely huge. And um, yeah, so I just want you to be aware of that. And, and I can confirm it so many different ways than, than you know. Oh, um, Interactive Brokers API. Okay, regarding Interactive Brokers, as I talked about the Timber Hill situation where I sold it off, um, I'm not going to get into that. I kind of explained my red flagness or leeriness of that but when you look at all the other brokers out there they're just as they're just as it's like picking the cleanest shirt of the ugly dirty shirts right interactive brokers is for sure the cleanest of all the brokers so go with them that's the standard you need 10 grand us to get started um if you got that kind of capital go for it um and, and for sure you know what you're doing go for it um and if you want to minimize your risk which is what we talked about tonight just start with a small basic Forex account and just write simple algorithms and automated or automation and get some solid uh, performance out of them and consistent performance. Consistency is the more important than anything else. And once you do that, then you start to scale up into the bigger brokers like interactive brokers. And then obviously as you scale, that will also increase your profit profitability as well consistently. That's why I use the word consistent. It's very important. Um, anybody else got any questions? Uh, I spoke for two hours here, which I don't mind. Anybody else? I usually do a go in once, go in three times. As I said, we're going to do a deep dive next week on the Federal Reserve. Um, just to understand what the Federal Reserve, they just did a, a, an increase on interest last week. And there's projection of another one in September. Um, and you, you can factor in probabilities of that increase based upon the economy um, and where things are at with the U.S. dollar and other factors as well we can go over. And again, I only use forward looking. I don't care what happened yesterday when it comes to these kind of calls because they're irrelevant. Um, there's times and times again where you can look at data and look for the cycles. doesn't mean what happens five years ago will happen tomorrow or next week. Um, it will come. But it's very, very difficult um, to, to, to calculate that precisely. And that's why it's more important to really analyze the fundamentals of the markets as we talked about tonight with the options chain and caught reports and all that. It's really, really powerful stuff. Anybody else got any comments or questions or anything? Um, if not, we can wrap her up tonight. I think we're losing people already. Okay. Um, I'll do it going once three times, and if not, we'll do next week, uh, 7 p.m. again to, uh, next week, which will be um, July 4th for U.S., but hey, it's the end of the holiday, so maybe you might come aboard. I don't know. Um, so I'll do it going once, two, three times. If not, we'll give it a wrap, and I'll put up this uh, video on YouTube, and we'll, um, we'll go from there. Okay, you guys know how to get in touch with me, right, on Facebook or Twitter or through um, my site. Uh, there's many places to get in touch with me. All right, so I'll um, do a going once, going twice. And again, this is for feedback or questions. Happy Canada. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gordon. Same to you. Same, uh, July 4th and happy Canada Day for everybody as well. Or happy holidays uh, next week. Okay, so we'll do a going three times. No? Okay, so we'll give it a wrap for tonight. Two-hour session. That was great. Um, thank you. Good night to all. Uh, include you, Brian, and uh, include me, Brian, and Gordon, and who, el who else? We got Jojo, RF, Gordon, and uh, I'm sure we got some other people here. Uh, 201, I guess it's an area code. Eric Ma, everybody that was part of this. Thanks for being part of this, and uh, I'll talk to you hopefully next week.
Okay, I'll end the session now. Later. Bye.